May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another QQ Audio podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of QQ Audio and QQ Archives. Doing our bit to help preserve the legacy of Shunju Suzuki and those whose paths cross his. And anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So uh, today we uh, have a guest, Gil Fransdell. Gil was uh, born in Norway and uh, went to the farm in Tennessee with long hair and uh, liked Zen Mind Beginner's Mind and ended up at Zen Center and he's uh, become, oh, and he, you know, he, he's, he's studied uh, uh, Theravadan Buddhism extensively, including in Myanmar, and he's going to tell you all that. In fact, he tells us the path, and, and it, it's, it's done quite a bit. It's really interesting. Or I'd say right, right up to the point where he becomes a teacher with the group. I'd say there's there's some important stuff we didn't get to in this uh, podcast, and I'm going to try to cover a little of that right now. And I'm going to do that by reading Gil's um, Wikipedia page. Gil Fransdale, born 1954, is a Norwegian-born American Buddhist teacher, writer, and scholar based in Redwood City, California. He has been practicing Buddhism of the Soto Zen and Vipassana sects since 1975 and is currently teaching the practice of Buddhism in the San Francisco Bay Area, having been taught by the Vipassana practitioner Jack Kornsfeld, uh, Franz Dale is part of the Vipassana Teachers Collective at Spirit Rock Meditation Center. He was ordained as a Soto Zen priest at the San Francisco Zen Center in 1982 and was a Theravada monk in Burma in 1985. In 1995, he received Dharma transmission from Mel Weitzman, the abbot of the Berkeley Zen Center. He is the guiding teacher of the Insight Meditation Center of Redwood City. He has a Ph.D. in Buddhist Studies from Stanford University. As many Dharma talks available online contain basic information on meditation and Buddhism as well as subtle concepts of Buddhism explained at the level of the layperson. Uh, Franz Dell has been credited with identifying, quote, what is perhaps the basic formula of success for any Buddhist group in America, spiritual practice, that is, meditation, removed from Asian cultural expressions. Franz Dell has also been noted for his this is another quote, analysis of the transformed role of sila, morality, in the Western insight meditation movement. And his view that the popularity of Vipassana meditation in middle-class America is related to its message of orthopraxy. Ha <laughs> ha! Right action. And its lack of cultural and historical baggage. His work has also been cited as a means by which First Nations people might, quote, change the reality of internalized oppression to the reality of peace. Uh, while his 2005 translation of the Dharmapada has been included in a suggested reading list for teaching college students about happiness. Uh, in a 
2011 discussion on the meaning of mindfulness, the American Theravada Buddhist monk Bhikkhu Bodhi cited Franz Dahl in the following passage as neatly summarizing the difference between traditional Buddhist practice and that being taught in the West. So here we go. I'm going to read what Gil said. Rather than stressing world renunciation, the Western teachers stress engagement with and freedom within the world. Rather than rejecting the body, these Western teachers embrace the body as part of the holistic field of practice. Rather than stressing ultimate spiritual goals such as full enlightenment, ending the cycle of rebirth, or attaining the various stages of sainthood, many Western teachers tend to stress the immediate benefits of mindfulness and untroubled equanimous presence in the midst of life's vicissitudes. This approach has been described as having traditional forms of Buddhism, quote, being expanded upon rather than rejected, with Fronsdale cited as calling on Vipassana teachers to study traditional Buddhism, not in order to adopt it wholesale, but to be more conscious about what is and what is not adopted and to take more responsibility for assumptions and intentions underlying innovation. Underlying assumptions and intentions underlying innovations. Yeah, he really thinks things through, huh? As such, Franz still is recognized as presenting meditation as the heart of the Buddhist path with the traditional Buddhist values of loving kindness, ethics, and generosity as key elements in mindfulness-based spiritual life among practitioners who are more likely to describe their involvement as spiritual rather than religious. Okay, uh, there's more at Liss's publications. Wow, hey, wow, pretty good. Uh, the Buddha Before Buddhism Wisdom from the Early Teachings, Shambhala, A Monastery Within, Tales from the Buddhist Path, Tranquil Books. Anyway, there's more. You can uh, go look it all up if you wish. I don't know where the uh, Sati Center fits into all this. Um, I, th the, the, I I think of Gill as founding the Sati Center. Maybe he founded it with, uh, you know, the Buddhist uh, uh, scholar and former Suzuki student, uh, Carl Bielfeld. I, I think of both of them. Uh, but Because they, they did the Shunyu Suzuki... Uh, conference in 1999 went on for two days was really something. Anyway, uh, the uh, I, I guess Bill uh, uh, Gill's group uh, is um, part of the Sati Center because uh, it's got the Insight Meditation Center and the Insight Retreat Center, uh, but. Uh, we didn't talk about that, so I'm not sure. But um, um, and I, I think the Saudi Center was the nonprofit he used uh, to uh, translate Shunyu Suzuki's college thesis, uh, which has never been released. <laughs> and it's been, it's been uh, I don't know, decades. I, I don't know how long. Uh, anyway. Maybe one of these days we'll be able to see it. That's enough. Uh, so, uh, look, as soon as we've had our pause to meditate, we'll give Gil Fronstel a call, and we can um, hear what brought him up to the point of starting the Saudi Center and the uh, Insight Meditation Center and Retreat Center and uh, all the other stuff he's done since then. So when you hear the bell, if you're of such a mind, hit pause. 
and meditate or whatever for as long as you wish. And when you're ready to come back, hit unpause. And we'll be here to hit the bell to end the meditation. And we'll give Gil Fronsdale a call. Hi, David. Hi, Gil. How are you doing? Hey, how are you? Okay. okay great. How are... Yeah. It's nice to hear your voice. Tell, tell me something about you first. You're in Bali? Yeah. And how's that going? Well, we've been here 10 years. Uh, Katrinka goes back usually most years. I don't. I've never been back. Uh, okay. And uh, uh, we can live much better here. Uh huh? than we can in America. And it's, uh, you know, we don't need a vehicle. And, uh, uh, oh, yeah, it's just a great place to work. I love the people. I don't think of it as paradise at all. <laughs> uh, how's, medic how's medical care? Excellent. Mm, good. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, the best hospital in Bali now is a 20-minute walk from here. And it's like going to wow. Kaiser in a, in a way. You know, uh -huh. I just go in and give my card, and I can see all, all sorts of different types of doctors and get tests and things in the same place. And I'm very impressed with it. And, uh, you know, like I had laser surgery on my uh, dislocated retina. Now that was that was like nine years ago, at uh, before this hospital was here, and that cost me the whole thing was three hundred dollars. Wow! So that gives you an idea. That was pretty extreme. <laughs> uh -huh. Good. Yeah, hey. yeah. So uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, we like it. Uh, uh, any 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 Zen going on there? Um, no, not really. Uh, I've done uh -huh. Vipassana retreats here uh, ah, with, with, with with Myanmar monks and oh, uh, nice. I, I yeah, I like them. Uh, they're, uh, uh -huh. they're just sitting and walking, you know, and uh -huh. uh, and you know the Mahasa uh -huh. method, huh? Yeah, yes, that's what I practiced. Yeah, well, that's just like Zazen. I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, yeah, uh, I have done one in a few years. I don't know. I mean, they're really hard. Uh, I don't when, know. when I went to, when I was going to go to Burma to practice, Okasan had tea with me. She invited me for tea. And she said to me, uh, Suzuki Roshi always wanted to go to Burma. Uh huh. And then she gave me a color photograph of Suzuki Roshi, and I took it with me. And when I came to Burma, I was uh, I was practicing there in a, in a special compound where the West the foreigners practiced. And lo and behold, who was practicing there as a monk was Ron Browning. Uh huh. Far. You remember him? Yeah. You remember him? Oh sure. And you remember how you remember you know that he was ordained by Suzuki Roshi, one of, of the course previous I first know. people. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah, okay, there. you know. <laughs> so I get so I so I, so I, so I gave him that photograph. Oh, that's wonderful! That's wonderful. Yeah, he continued. Uh, you should, you must know, uh, having uh, very active involvement with uh, 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 Theravadan teachers. Uh, yes, uh, he's yes, brought him to America. Uh, my, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, maybe my closest friend who's an American here is, uh, was in Myanmar for seven years. And he, he stayed at, uh, he's American. He was with, uh, Kaplow's group 
for oh, nine wow. years. Before uh-huh. that, uh, he was a monk there. And uh, he stayed at Ron's place in, uh, you know, in uh, Green, Green Green Valley Road. I can't quite remember. That, that, that makes sense. Up there in Marin or something. Yeah. Like that. No, no. It's Sonoma. Yeah. Sonoma. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I've been there. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I should get hold of Ron. I haven't, I haven't been in touch with him in a while, but, uh, yeah. He, yeah. It'd be nice to interview him in his time with Suzuki Roshi. And it'd be uh, nice for him to tell, it'd be nice for him to tell the story of being a, a Heiji. Yeah, well, I've got, I've got that from him, you know, it's on cute. Oh, you do? Okay. Good. Yeah, I'd like to hear it again. He's hesitant. Um, uh, I I should try to, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he wouldn't do a podcast. Uh, uh, the, you know, uh, he's hesitant to say too much, but uh, uh-huh. got quite a bit from him uh, in, in one interview I did, oh, I don't know, 20 years ago or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not clear uh, about, so I'd like to ask him, Something because uh, Richard Baker uh, th- th- says uh, that they, you know, uh, sedated him at AHG to get him yeah, out. Yeah, he of there. confirmed that. He, he he confirmed that for me. Yeah, tell me what he said. Because Hoitsu, oh, well, see, I, the- I put that in crooked cucumber, and for the translation into Japanese, Hoitsu oh, said absolutely that did not happen. So, oh well. I, well, I ran into Ron Browning in uh, Burma, and he told me he had a background with Zen Center, and he went to Aheji. And I asked him, are you the monk who uh, was sedated? Were you the one who was – yes, I was sitting in the, I was sitting in the gaitan, because, uh, because meditating when you're not supposed to because everything there is in a group. And so, so he, he wanted to meditate more, so he was sitting in the gaitan, and – and then uh, he saw on the on the corners of his of his eyes coming at him was this group of monks uh, coming at him, and uh, the next thing he knew, he woke up on the train going to Yazu. All right, thank you for telling me that. Oh that's boy, what told, that's that's what I got from him directly. So, all right, if you haven't gotten that from him directly. You should have that. You should get that on tape. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's one of the things I, I. Uh, you know, I just let him say what he wanted to say. I generally yeah. do that. I don't. I'm. I, I don't want to be a journalist and pry. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Uh, but um, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, ha ha ha! I don't think I'll bother Hoitsu with it. Though. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's sort of embarrassing. No, no, no. It's it's too and. Who oh, it's just so deeply connected to Heiji that he probably doesn't want to have any funny things to be said yeah. about Heiji. And that's okay. Listen, I told him they kept asking me permission for every change. And I said, you make any change you want. You know, he 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 left in one thing about Kishizawa uh, and the war, but he wanted uh, another uh, one. He left in, I think, that Kishizawa regretted his... Mm, his role or, you know, just what he was saying during the war. But uh, there was another point where he asked to be taken out. And, and that was just for, um, you know, it was embarrassing. Uh, uh-huh. So that's when all. When did Kichizawa die? When did Kichizawa die? Around 55, I think, just off the top of my I head. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, I might be wrong with that. Um I I remember in the uh c- curriculum vitae uh how do you pronounce that? Uh-huh. Uh curriculum vitae that's uh-huh. uh vitae. that uh Suzuki made with Kobun he said he wrote that his uh study with Kishizawa ended in 53 or something might have been 55 but I, I I noted that it was before Kichizawa died, and I was sort of wondering. Uh, but anyway, uh, wasn't anybody to ask about that? 
Uh, well, that's a ho- Hoitzer would know that probably. Well, you know, I'm not, I don't want to bother Hoitzer. He had yeah, had yeah. to deal with me on that stuff so much. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah. I, I, I tend to deal with Shungo, you know, his son. Oh, and, he has. He doesn't know that much, does he? No, but just for communication, he doesn't know anything. Actually, <laughs> actually, Hoitzu didn't know a lot either. He was uh-huh. educated by the whole thing. You know, his whole trip was, uh-huh. my father didn't do anything during the war, you know. But we got together with guys who were with Shunyu during the war. Uh-huh. And um, uh, they said, oh, yes, he did, you know. And, and <laughs> they were told, you know, they, they were, they, they, there were nothing like what was happening here at uh, Rinso Inn. Uh, nah, you know, it was, uh, it was, they had this sort of salon where people could speak more freely and, uh, that, you know. That Rinzo in? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, but they weren't saying, look, you, you the, uh, they weren't saying anything seditious or that, uh-huh. that, that you know, it just would be talking about uh, how uh, maybe the war uh, uh, is is causing a lot of damage for Japan, how to bring it to a conclusion. And there was a guy there, uh, Nishi Nakama, who was the – I mean, Suzuki tended to just sit and listen, you know. Nishi Nakama, yeah. though, his uh, – his father was well placed with uh, military planners in Tokyo, and he was very outspoken. And he was more the the leader of the group. Oh. And uh, oh. but they weren't, you know. It was just sort of like being in America and not really being an anti-war person, but wishing the war would stop. Uh-huh. Uh, you know. Uh, uh-huh. Anyway, it's, um, you know, and Japanese are so nuanced uh, that it's hard for us to comprehend what, how they would have been communicating with each other about those things. So, listen, I want to hear more uh, about um, how you got to Myanmar and all that. But first, tell me, what are you up to right now? Oh, what am I up to these days? Well, I run two Buddhist centers and, uh, and a number of programs. So I'm very busy with teaching retreats and teaching insight meditation. Uh, and then I'm also uh, very much involved with uh, putting on training programs now. Yeah. And, uh, and so I now ha- now involved uh, in a insight meditation teacher training for our center with 15 people who are in it. And that's very exciting. Very mature practitioners. Mm. And then I'm also, I'm also involved with um, training people who are already insight meditation teachers, training them to um, teach uh, insight retreats in the wilderness. That takes a whole different set of skills than the inside four walls. And, uh, and it has all kinds of opportunities because when you you probably know this from Tassahara, when you spend a lot of time outdoors, the natural world becomes your teacher. And uh, you know when you spend a lot of time inside of four walls, it's pretty easy for people to get self-centered and self-focused. Mm-hmm. But when you're outdoors a lot in, in the natural world, um, a lot, that sense of self-focus changes a lot. Mm. And to combine that that shifting perspective with uh, being on meditation retreat is really fantastic. Mm. So, I'm, so anyway, so the whole movement I'm trying to support, I, I, wasn't, I didn't start it, but I'm a supporter of it, of um, uh, getting uh, uh, more people to go off into the wilderness to practice, and maybe with groups, with cooks, and just you know, make, it, make it possible for people to really go out there and have nature be the be the teacher. And that's, that's something that goes back to the time of the Buddha. I mean, for thousands of years, yeah, uh, practitioners would go practice in the forest. So now it's a little bit more, you know, we, we organize it more and there, people have to sign liability forms and things like that. Mm. 
So that's the other thing. Wow. And then, uh, yeah, so I do that and and uh, I'm getting ready for kind of a uh, yeah, I'm, I'm starting another teacher training program here, and we call this a Dharma Leader Program. This would be kind of like uh, maybe bringing people up to the level of Shuso, where they can start doing some teaching, but they're not they don't have Dharma transmission yet. Mm-hmm. And uh, so. Uh, so there's programs, and then I'm teaching courses, year-long courses on early Buddhist ethics. I have a early Buddhist ethics, a year course in early Buddhist meditation, and a year-long course program on early Buddhist wisdom. So the you know the three treasure, the three uh, trainings: ethics, meditation, and wisdom. And uh, and so that's really great. I mean, the idea is to do more than just teach a class. The idea is to practice with this and to allow for some deeper reflection. So mm. I love these programs. That's, I do programs like that. And, and then I'm, oh, I'm, not, I'm getting to be an old teacher. What? Say it again. And I, I'm, bec- I'm starting to become an old teacher. Oh, oh right, right. <laughs> and, how uh, and how so old? How old? I'm, I'm going to be 70 this year. Oh, you're a youngster. And, uh, Youngster, but what happened? What, what I'm realizing about this role is that at some point, my my job is not is not so much to teach myself, but to uh, support and train and support other people to teach, give them the opportunity to develop as yeah. teachers. Yeah. Be- because one of the best ways to practice is to teach, and uh, mm. and so I, I want anyway. So I feel like that's my kind of stage of life that I'm at that is uh, is more like passing it on mm. in some uh, important way. Mm. Wow, that's impressive. So supporting other people to teach. Is it? And so and so I looked at how, how do I create more opportunities for people to teach? And, and uh, so when, I, when, we, when we invited these 15 people to be in our teacher training, we, the invitation said, and don't assume that this invitation means you're going to get a chance to teach at IMC or IRC because there's not that many opportunities here. But uh-huh. what's happening is that we're, we're, we're finding ways of um, opportunities for them to teach or for us to organize retreats uh, away from our center, mm. so other places in the country and different things. So now it turns out uh, we do have opportunities to give them, and that's so exciting. So trying to develop those opportunities, find ways to find the financing of those opportunities. Because you know, for us, the financing is, a, is an art form because uh, we do everything for free. Yeah, so, excellent. So how do, you find that? how do you find, but how do you finance free? Yeah. Because it costs money to rent uh, retreat centers and buy food and these kind of things. So that's the art. And so yes. we're kind of working the edge of that and trying to trying to find out how we can do this in our system and so that these new teachers have opportunities to teach. Yeah, that's great. That's very impressive. Uh, uh, you, you know, um, in 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 in. in in uh, Japan or India, different places, they're, they're, you know, the funding is set up because it's been, these places have been there, these ashrams and monasteries and temples. Uh-huh. They're, they're, they've been there for, you know, for millennia or hundreds of years. And there's community and membership. And there's a whole support system around it. Yes. But, but uh, you're you're doing something new. Uh, pretty much all Buddhism in America is new and how to support it is a problem and I really salute you for making it free I mean that's what I try to do I make everything free you know Uh you know if you publish a book that's not up to you Um, but um, uh, I heard Shasta Abbey did that a long time ago decades ago Oh, they they offered their retreats for free. They they went. Uh, I think they stopped. Uh, they they went to completely uh, being run on donations. 
Fantastic. How did you know that? I I just remember hearing that a long time ago, you know, decades ago. Uh Uh, And I've I've sort of wanted to check up on it and see if they've still done that because – I know, uh, like Gita Gayatri, you know her uh, the, from yes, yes, India, uh-huh. right? Well, I I yes. spent some time there in uh, Tiruvannamalai, uh, uh, going to the Ramana Ashram, and uh, there was a, a Zen type teacher who was um, a Catholic priest in Tamil Nadu. But she was so offended because he had a charge, and it was so minimal. But, uh, uh, you know, they just don't do that in India. Uh, but he had no community or tradition behind him, and so he had to figure out some way to do it. Anyway, uh, that's great. That's really good to hear. That's as impressive as as teaching the Dharma. This is making it free. <laughs> Good. Yeah, oh. I, I, sometimes I say the medium is the message, and so part of the message is how we do how we do the uh, do our offerings here. But you know, some of that uh, some of that is what I picked up from Zen Center when I was in student there, and maybe I picked up things that maybe it was maybe I was predisposed to interpret it that way, but I was very shaped by the fact that you didn't. You didn't expect to get. Uh, uh, you just served. You just practiced and served, and you didn't look for a financial return for it, really. Yeah. And if you became a teach, if you, if you were teaching, that was just part of your practice. You would teach, and you would teach without any concern about getting paid for teaching. Right. And right. Uh, and uh, and the idea just make everything everything available. And Zen Center was very, I feel, very generous to me. Um, you know, I got some uh, uh, loans to go to Tassahara, mm-hmm. and then when I was after I was ordained as a priest, that was a forgiven. So it, they made it. Then they made it so easy and so accessible. Yeah. And um, and somehow the, my, I I interpret that for myself as yeah, let's not practice the Dharma uh, for the sake of money. That that's that's against what the Dharma is. Uh, let's just yeah. do it because people invite us and we just love to offer it and. That's just offered for free, and yeah. uh, I think that comes from Zen, Zen. For me, that 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 I think that came more from Zen Center than anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, they're sort of in a bind now with some things like Green Gulch and Tassahara. There's so many expenses, uh, you know. In the in did you the, hear? Did you hear about the? Did you hear about the retreat I talked with Paul Haller this summer? Last summer. Uh, tell me. So Paul and I taught a three week. Zen inten- intensive at Tassahara, and uh, so we uh, and we asked Zen Center to offer for free, and uh, and they agreed. Believe it or not, they agreed. Yeah, and uh, and it was a good experiment. It was a wonderful, wonderful event. I was so happy, and Paul was happy, and we had such a good time. And uh, and then uh, and then uh, we did things kind of differently, and it was so much fun to do it differently. And then, um, and then they had uh, the people at Zen Center had a amount of money they expected from you know uh, for every week there's a, some event at Tassahara, a certain amount of money, and we ended up uh, people made donations on their own for being there then, and they took in more money than they would have expected. Yeah, that's good to hear. So these, that's good to hear. Yeah, but uh, so this, yeah, yeah. So it worked. so even at Zen Center it works. Yeah, the whole giving things for free. Yeah, so, so I don't know. If it's, I don't know if it's going to affect Zen Center, but uh, it certainly was, it was really fun to teach there. And well, it's it's uh, last summer. I I I wrote and asked them. I was communicating with somebody in the office about this, and this last summer the because they sent out uh, b- 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 letters or emails. To prior shoe subs, you know, hey, if you want to come do a one week, oh, yes. two week yeah. uh, program here, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, what does it entail? Well, the people who go to it have to pay $150 a day. Yes, crazy. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> I can't yes, comprehend that. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, we did it. We did it and uh, for free. And Zen Center got more money than they had hoped for. Yeah, well, that's good. That's really good to hear. Um, uh, you know, back back in uh, the, uh, the 60s uh, and, and uh, seven, I, I, it, it did people did have to pay for a practice period like uh, maybe the first one a dollar a day or two dollars uh-huh. a day that, and, yeah. uh-huh. um, and you know there were all sorts of scholarships given uh-huh. uh, I never paid for anything or got paid for anything uh, because I'd <laughs> given money it was, just, it was all very loosely done uh, but um, you know back then Everything was so different. Yeah, yeah, I know. Radically uh, different. Uh, it, 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 the different. Money was different. Money was much better distributed. And, and uh, you know, you could live really cheap. And uh, you, could, you could get a house in San Francisco. But where I come from in Texas, poor people, many poor people, we would consider poor, they would have a little house. Uh, uh-huh. And, uh, you know, the... The money has been sucked up from the lower uh, levels to the upper levels to such an extent. Now, I, it's everything sort of career oriented now, whereas it was community oriented back then. Uh, seems. Yes, I agree. I know. That's wonderful what you're doing. What's the name of your organization? <laughs> you know. Oh. It, it, the the uh the main place the the, the mother temple is um insight meditation center uh-huh and it's so that's the, we 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 lack creativity so that's the now name. when you say here uh where are you talking about redwood city california really yeah i was, i thought of you as mountain view no we're uh, less k is in mountain view but we're in redwood city Oh, that's case it's in about, Mountain it, it, View. Yeah, yeah, it's about that's about twenty minutes away on the freeway. Or yeah, like. yeah, yeah. Redwood City, and then and then our we have a, and we have a retreat center called Insight Retreat Center that is um, that is in Santa Cruz. Uh, where in Santa Cruz? Uh, on Glen Canyon Road. It's a uh, kind of uh, almost in Scotts Valley, so a little bit little bit up in the little bit rural part of Santa Cruz. How far from Jikoji? Oh, to go down Highway 9 from Jikoji? Oh, it'd probably take a... It's probably probably a 30, 40-minute drive. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. wow. Okay, okay. Um, it's windy roads up there. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's a wonderful area. I uh, sometimes uh, I'd go to Tassajara by going through it and add an hour to the trip, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and oh yeah, wonderful. Um, so, uh, uh, how did you get involved in all this? I mean, what 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 was your what's your oldest uh, recollection of anything that uh, sort of turned your life toward practice? Probably the strongest thing that happened is I was living, living on a farm in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And when I got, and when I got there, when I was there, then my beginner's mind was kind of like the Bible of the farm. Everyone, a lot of people had copies. So, um, Whoa, you were living it. on Steve Gaskin's farm? Yeah. No kidding. I had no idea. Wow. All right. Please and so I, I read. I, I wasn't there for. I was there for four months, so it wasn't that long. Uh-huh. But that's where I was. That's where I was in, introduced to Zen by Beginner's Mind. Oh. And um, and uh, I was that book really moved me. That I kind of you know I just I was in, enamored with it, or captivated by it. And what what I fe- felt over and over again as I read it was, um, uh, these are things that I know. I just didn't know I knew them. Ah, uh, it, it was that was I mean that's a strange thing to say, but that was the feeling. They were so familiar. There's oh way I know this. This I can feel this. I, and uh, um, but I had a sense that uh, I understood from the book. I got the sense that zazen was important, and uh, and even though it was the Bible of the farm, the closest thing to it, 
they um, people weren't really sitting meditating. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that was that uh, I was a little bit uncomfortable there. I loved it there, and the reason I loved it, the reason I stayed, I was only there for three days. That was the original intention to visit. Was um, they had a practice? Their their primary spiritual practice was honesty, and I'd never and and that was because they had been the primary uh, religious practice had been LSD, uh-huh. but in Tennessee you in Tennessee they couldn't really do you do LSD anymore. In fact, when I got there, Stephen Gaskin was in jail because of that, and um, uh-huh. so they had to find another way. And what they what they decided was the, the the best next thing to LSD is honesty. Huh. And I was blown away by what I saw. And that was actually I, I had no interest in spirituality, but they said they were spiritual. So I said, Wow, I guess maybe I do have interest in spirituality. That um and this honesty thing. And then when I was there, I discovered then my beginner's mind. And then after a while though, I felt all these people, all these hippies here, all these people, they're too much like me. We're all middle class white hippies. Mm. And I, it's not safe. It's not, it's not safe to be around people who are just like you. That's what I said to myself. Yeah. And I said, you know, I don't, I don't feel really safe here to be, you know, everyone with the same opinions, hope, orientation. So, um, so I decided to leave. And then I wanted to go check out Zen Center because of the Zen by Beginner's Mind. So I, I sent a letter to Zen Center and asked if I can come and be a guest student. And, uh, and I went for two weeks. And I think I might have gone to a lecture first at City Center or probably at City Center. And uh, wasn't there a black priest named Pam Jackson back then? Uh, well, yeah, I can't remember if she was a priest, but... Yeah, Pam was there. <laughs> yeah, so she did that that day that day when I came, and Richard Baker was going to give a talk. I didn't know Richard Baker from anyone, but he was supposed to give a talk, and so I asked her, um, "Is he enlightened?" And that the, I should have listened to her response. She kind of a little bit got a little bit kind of angry, and she said, "You have to ask him." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that was, you know, I, I didn't think I didn't think anything of it at the time, but um, anyway. So uh, and anyway, so then that July, I went back. I went to be a guest student at, at uh, City Center, and uh, while I was there, laying on the guest student bed in the guest student in the basement, I remember uh, very clearly Paul Howler arrived, just fresh off being a monk in Thailand. Oh and, uh, wow! I remember the sparkle. I remember the sparkle in his eyes. Wow! It was quite something. And uh, and uh, and uh, what year? So then I uh, stayed for two weeks. And this, this must have been 1975. Uh huh. Yeah, 75. And I thought this is uh, what I want to do. This is kind of fits me. But I was 21, or, and I decided that I thought you know. I want to do this, but I'm only 21, and I have some loose ends to figure out. And one of the loose ends was I was born in Norway. So I said, you know, I need to go back and figure out my relationship to Norway. Wow. Hmm. So I went to Norway, and, um, and, uh, and I worked on a farm there, loved farming, and uh, decided I now I want, decided I want to go and be a farmer in Norway, and buy a farm. Mm. But the law in Norway is that if you, the law in Norway is you could only buy a farm if you have a vocational education in farming, which is a two-year education. Mm. And then I thought, well, I only have two more years left at UC California to get a degree. Why don't I go to the best agricultural school in the world and get the degree from there? Because that does two things. If I ever decide to do something dis- different than farming, I have this really good degree, you know, like a like a community college degree, and that puts me close to Zen Center, and so that I can maybe continue the Zen practice. Hmm. And so then, uh, so then I went to UC Davis, and uh, and and then when I was there, I would go down to Zen Center to, and actually I went mostly to Berkeley Zen Center. 
to do uh, day long retreats. They don't, you know, stay day long sessions. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, uh, and that was really great. And, uh, and then I did sign up in the summer of 77 for a session at City Center. But then I called up the office a week or two before and I said, something important has come up and I can't make it. And they said, okay, we'll take you off. But the important thing that came up, I didn't tell them. It, it was fear. So I chickened out of my first session. Oh, and, uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And uh, so then I uh, graduated in 78 with my ag degree. And uh, and then I wanted to be more – by that time, I'd been sitting uh, every, twice a day at home, same schedule kind of as Zen Center, 40 minutes in the morning, 40 minutes in the evening kind of. And that's what I did, and except for Sunday. And there was a sitting group, a Zen group in uh, Davis. I sat with them twice a week. And Mel would come up and periodically and do half-day sittings for us mm. in Dokusan. And, uh, and by the time that those two years were over uh, – uh, I wanted to uh, find some way for my Zaza and mind to be better integrated in my daily life outside of uh, outside of Zaza. And the only way I can do that was to go be close to Zen Center. Mm. So I went to into the city that fall and got a job at Tassahara Bakery and and uh, rented a room with some other Zen students and others in on Webster Street near the Mint. And then every morning I'd go sit and then I don't know what I did the rest of the morning, but then at noon I'd, I'd go work at the Tassara Bakery. Mm. And uh, and that was a nice uh, work until like seven or something. And then I went home and slept and got up the next morning. And that was a nice life. But then in April I sat a sashin at Green Gulch. And then I kind of got a sense of Green Gulch. I said, wait a minute, I want to live here. <laughs> I want to practice here. So I applied, and they and they accepted me. I've been and waiting so for moved. that. I mean, you're interested in this farming. You think I keep waiting yeah, for yeah. green goats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so so then I, I went there and worked uh, worked in the fields. And that, I loved the life at Green Gulch because back then, it, everything was so simple back then. But mm. uh, it, it was a wonderful, immersive life of zazen and work. And... Uh, and uh, the combination of zazen, a little bit of community work, once a week maybe, or once in a while there was a class, maybe Richman would teach or someone that, you know, was Wednesday nights or something. It was really nice to, to uh, listen to. And, uh, and it was kind of an immersive life and this whole way of being that made such a wonderful impact, impression on me or impact on me. Mm. And so... But I, I was scheduled. I had, I had been, I had, uh, I had been accepted to go to graduate school by that time. I was going to go to UC Berkeley to study soil science after an ag degree. Really, my gosh! And, um, and so, and so I was. Uh, but I went to live at Green Gulch, and then at the beginning of August, I realized, hey, Gil, uh, classes begin in a few weeks in Berkeley, and you haven't done anything about it. You haven't thought about it even. No, no place to live, nothing. And so I said, what am I going to do? So that was a Sunday, I think. And that was a little bit, I don't know, there was some energy or questioning or doubt or I don't know what there was. I was moved in some way. So I did something unusual, uh, which is they had noon service on Sundays, but no one ever really went to it. Just, the, you know, almost no one. But I went anyway, and I chanted the Heart Sutra. In the middle of the Heart Sutra, I had a something went off deep inside like bang that quickly and I, just, and I knew I was going to discuss Sahara <clears throat> mm. and I had to, did another one of those phone calls uh, it wasn't a phone call it was a, le- a letter to UC Berkeley and said something has come up <laughs> and um, can I defer my my uh, going to Berkeley for a year and so then in uh, in January of 1980 I went to Tuscaloosa. Sahara mm. And that was wonderful. Mm. Wow! I loved I loved I loved Tassahara life. Uh, I thought that I kind of decided, for me at least, 
that this is the perfect lifestyle. Yeah. Just just living it. Yeah. Yeah, I went to Tassajara in 1980, and that was really great. Um, now, uh, what was your relationship with Richard Baker? It was... Uh, uh, it was it was good. Uh, I, I don't have any complaints about my relationship to him. Actually, I'm quite grateful for him for a number of things. A number of things. Yeah. But it was also it was also a bit distant. Mm-hmm. Um, now it was a little bit. I didn't expect too much from him, um, and he was kind of isolated from newer students like me. He wasn't. You know, you didn't have that much contact with him. And I hadn't sacrificed, and I hadn't sacrificed my life for him or for Zen Center by the time the the, the whole problems with him arose. So I didn't feel betrayed because I I just had been benefiting from being there. Yeah. So I never I never felt personally betrayed. Yeah. And I, I didn't hold him up too high on the pedestal. The my first kind of uh, impression of Richard Baker was. Early on, I went maybe the first time I went to Green Gulch for a Sunday morning talk or something, mm-hmm. and I saw his car, and uh, he had an Audi back then. Right. And uh, and an Audi for me, being a poor hippie, was ostentatious. And, uh, <laughs> it was like way over, over the top. And and so so oh. I thought, what is a Zen master doing with an Audi? But make to make it worse was his license plate. The license plate was zero zero Zen, uh-huh. and, and and I looked at the, the car and the license plate myself. Um, um, I don't approve of this person's lifestyle, but I can learn Zen from him. Yeah, I think that's a good attitude. And uh, and uh, and I don't think that nowadays I don't think that's a really good attitude or really good. I'd rather not make that separation anymore. Yeah. But at the time that's that served me well. Yeah, I think it it's good when you when you first go, you know, you can rule everybody out for their imperfections. Uh incidentally he wanted to get the license plate cloud, but it was already oh. taken. Uh, oh. and, and, uh yeah, that Zen was a mistake. Uh he he went on to other uh vanity plates <laughs> as they were called. <laughs> Hey, my favorite vanity plate in San Francisco was, I'd see it every now and then, was a Rolls Royce, and it was rude. (laughs) (laughs) And and, and so my my relationship to him was, so he was a little distant, you know, distant not in the sense that he wasn't around for new students like me to spend much time with. I loved listening to his Dharma talks. Yeah. And... um, and uh, and then I wanted to go to Tassajara, and I was told you can't go to Tassajara unless you ask him to be your teacher. And uh, oh, I is kind of, that right? Okay, I'll do. That's huh. what I was told. So so I asked him if I he would be my teacher, and but you know it was I felt it was a little bit performa. Yeah. To do that, and but I was happy to do that, and uh, so I went to Green Gulf, to Tassajara, and um, and uh, and then at some point uh, I. Oh, there was so I think in a, my second summer there. Uh, so he doesn't didn't come around that often, even during practice periods. You know, he was often not there for big chunks of time. And so the second summer that I was there, he was coming down for the summer for some days, and there was opportunity to sign up for practice discussion. And so I used, somehow that that was a catalyst for me to really get serious about what am I doing with my life. What's, what's, what do I want to do? And, and, um, and so I went and sat by the upper barn on the deck there looking over the Tassara Creek. And I, I was starting to reflect or think once more, you know, what, what am I going to do? And then I had like, like that time at uh, Gringotts during noon service, I had another one like these, like the little explosion went off inside and I knew I wanted to be a priest. Yeah. And then, because I'm a rational guy, I thought now I have to figure out reasons why. But I, I didn't. The reason didn't matter. What matter was that I really knew this is what I was going to do. And uh, so I went to Richard Baker and asked him if he would ordain me, or if I could be ordained. And to my surprise, he said yes. I kind of thought it would be a big deal, but I asked, and he said yes. It was like real easy. And um, and so then uh, I called up to Bled. 
church in the city and said, I'm, being, I'm going to be ordained and could you send me the sewing material? And she sent me blue cloth. And I called her, no, no, I'm being ordained as a priest. I never had, I never had yukai. Mm-hmm. I was just a long haired hippie. And, uh, uh, and so she, I think she called around and said, is this for real? And, and I guess it was for real. So I got the black material. And then at the same time as Vicky was sewing, the ah. fall practice, fall practice period. So we actually did it together and she, you know, she knew how to sew more than I did. Yeah. So we kind of measured together and worked together and, and all, all the free time I had, any time I had during that practice period was spent sewing. Oh, well, partly because at some point uh, Richard Baker announced the ordination is going to be in December. And I said, what? I thought it'd be years before I got ordained. And, uh, and, and so it literally it ended up being in January. Mm. And uh, so we were ordained and, um, and with Vicki and with, um, with um, Gary McNabb. Ah, ah. And, th- and then we, um, and then I went back to Sahara. And then I was asked to, first day they were thinking of asking me to go work at the, at the at the Elias Stitchery. But instead they asked me to leave Tassahara to go work at the, at the Greens. But what happened was after that summer I was ordained, so like the summer of 82, and the early in the summer my sister came to visit me. And my sister was really sick. Mm. Really, really sick. And, um, but uh, we thought maybe she was going to die. But uh, she came there for a while, maybe I don't know, maybe a week or two or something, and uh, it was amazing to see how she revived being in that social environment, Tassara. She would sit on the porch of the of the above the dining room, and she couldn't really go anywhere. She had to be driven to uh, the baths, mm. but she'd hold court there, and people hung out with her and talked with her, and and uh, and it looked so good for her, so. Going back to L.A. meant being uh, holed up in a teeny little bedroom and just being miserable and lonely, and it probably would have been the death of her, literally. And so I asked Richard Baker if she can come spend the summer at Tassara. And to my surprise, uh, he said yes, provided that uh, she has your, she can have your room. And so I spent the summer living, uh, sleeping in the Zendo. That's wonderful. And, uh, she, That's wonderful. She stayed. And yeah. at the end of the summer... I asked if she could move into city center and he said, yes. And mm. she wasn't a Zen student. She had, you know, she wasn't a Zen student. There was nothing that, uh, you know, she could provide Zen center. There was never any request that we pay for her rent or anything. It was just, yes. And, um, and mm. so she lived at Zen center for, I think she lived there for maybe a year and a half, mm-hmm. a year, a year and a half. And uh, it was so healing for her, and and she became friends with uh, Isan and Steve um, Allen. She was a little, little Steve Allen and um, the guy who went to Japan, um, Mike Jamble. Um, Mike Jamble. They all. They all. They all. And and um, Robert Lytle. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, they all. They, they all. They, they, they all became her buddies, and. Uh, and uh, and so she had a she lived in the basement next to the library, in the little room, and and uh, it kind huh. of shaped her life too. It was wait a minute, really wait a minute. Stuff. She lived oh. in the basement. Oh, you mean behind the library, one of those little tiny rooms? Yeah, tiny rooms. Kind of, there was a little bathroom across the hall there, just uh, as you go towards the back door there. Yeah, there. right. Oh my gosh, yeah. that's really tiny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but she, it worked well for her. So in terms of my relationship to Richard Baker, uh, you know, uh, you know, this is part of the reason why I was so grateful to him. He, he yeah. extended, as far as I could tell, this generosity and hospitality to my sister who was so sick and and uh, for no financial return at all. Yeah. And um, that was a beautiful thing he did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he was really good uh, in so many ways about things. Like he was very consider it, you know, uh, uh, but, 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 you know, who was it? I think Elizabeth Sawyer said to me that 
when Blanche wanted to stay in the building to die, but she had to go to a convalescent home, and Elizabeth said, you know, if I, if uh, Baker wrote she had still been Abbott, uh, she would have stayed. I agree. I, I, I believe that's the case. And I was surprised by that choice of Zen Center. That, that seemed like. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I agree. Yeah. I, but, you know, uh, whoever made that decision or whatever, however it was made, you know, they I, I think they just felt they couldn't deal with they with they weren't qualified. You know, Dick, Dick's point yes. of view was, you know, whatever he wanted, whatever he thought was right or whatever he wanted for himself for good reasons or bad reasons. First, let's do it. Next, let's figure out how to do it. And he also had a whole uh, troop of basically free labor who would just do whatever he said. <laughs> and, and, and by the time that Blanche was dying, uh, the culture and the way people were at Zen Center were, was not that way. Right, right. And, uh, and so the, you know, there wasn't, you know, the, the idea that there was all this free labor to take care of someone who was sick. That's right. That, that it, it wasn't going to work. That's a very good point. That, again, moving from the communal to the uh, – uh, career oriented are the, yeah. uh, you know, people have to fend for themselves more. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Um, and it's, yes, yes. Um, yes. You know, there's a term called presentism that's been used on some of this woke stuff. It's like holding the past a- accountable, uh, according to present day, uh, uh standards. Yeah. But uh, I think uh, I'm guilty of holding the present accountable because of how <laughs> it was in the past. <laughs> so you're a pastism person. Yeah. A pastimist. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, um, so um, uh, keep going. Keep going. So what happened then? Oh, so then I went um, – so – I went to work at Greens, and um, that was fine. I enjoyed working there quite a bit, mm-hmm. and I uh, sitting closet in the morning, and then I would either walk, walk or run down, I guess, Laguna Street all the way to the bay, and then go work at Greens. Yeah, and uh, and so I liked it a lot. Um, but then somewhere around March, maybe of it must have been March of '83. Uh huh. Um, I was starting to feel that uh, Zen Center was a little bit claustrophobic, a little bit narrow-minded, and that I it was a time for fresh air. Yeah. And uh, and uh, and but you know I was just been ordained, and I had this idea that you should stay with your ordination teacher for a while before going away, like five years or something at minimum. Yeah. And so so uh, there was this woman Monique, I think, from Canada. Mm-hmm. who was uh, my friend, and uh, I was sitting in the courtyard with her, uh, and she was the first person I was going to whisper, tell her this feeling I had about Zen Center, and I wanted to get some fresh air. It wasn't like I had a complaint about Zen Center, just like something about how it was there. It was something like it's too closed or something. Yeah. And so, and so I was telling her this, and it kind of, just about like as I was telling her this, um, uh, um, Ed Brown came over to me and tapped me on my shoulder and said, "You know, when you finish here, uh, uh, and I'm from, I'm on the board, and I, I need to talk to you about something." And say, like, "What? What is the Ed? Ed and Ed on the board? Why? What? Am I in trouble? What's what's this about?" <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so so I, after I finished talking to Monique. I went over to uh, his house, and uh, and uh, he sat me down, and he explained to me what was going on with Richard Baker. The scandals were just erupting, and before it went public, they wanted the people like me, the priests and people, to know firsthand what was going on. Oh, yeah, right, right. And so he was telling me this, and my reaction hearing this was, great, I'm free. (laughs) <laughs> and I, I, I had been I had been invited and I had an invitation 
someone's going to pay my trip to uh, go to Japan. And I said, oh, now I can go practice in Japan. Wow. So for me, this, the, you know, the scandal was not only was it, I didn't feel betrayed. You know, Patricia Baker hadn't hurt me in any kind of way. Yeah. Um, I, it was just exactly the opportune moment. It couldn't have been a better moment. I, um, <laughs> That's I was, great. I, you know, I, I was set free. Mm-hmm. And so I went to, to Japan for a year. And uh, where where'd you and, go? What'd uh, you do? Okay, so I went there and I had almost no money. And so I decided that I would uh, teach English for a while to make money. That's the responsible thing to do. Right. But I had, I think, two, I think it was two weeks before my gig was going to start. And so I um, then what was, what does a Zen priest do in Japan? Well, I'll go to Obama and uh, sit with Harada Roshi at um, Okokoji. They were doing a sashin. Oh, Tongan. So I was there. Uh, no, the other one. Uh, you said Bukokuji. Oh, 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 maybe it's... Uh, no, no. It's Hoshinji. Was, Ho- Hoshinji, yes. Yeah. And so um, they didn't talk to each other back then. They, yeah, they yeah. Each other. Yeah. But anyway, so so I went to Hoshinji and sat to Sashin. And, um, and during that Sashin, I said, what am I doing going to teach English? I came to Japan to study Zen. I'm going to cancel my gig. And um, and come with me, I'm going to follow Zen, follow the Zen path. So then I was there, and I then I went and sat, went to I went to uh, Zogenji. Where, and, where? Uh, Zogenji? Zogen, Zogenji with the with the Dosan back then. He was called oh Dosan. yeah, right, right. You were there. Yeah. And uh, and so I, and so he I was there when he put on his first sashin, and because I was the only priest. I had certain seniority, so I got to sit next to him. And what it, what it meant to be sit next to him is every time I fell asleep, he would reach over and, and tug my sleeves. Mm. And um, so that was nice to practice with. I, I liked him a lot, and he gave me a lot of confidence in it as, a, as a teacher. Yeah. And and uh, so I think I did a couple of sessions with him. But then, uh, you know Gengo Akiba? Yeah, sure. Okay, so so... The year before I went to Japan, Gengo had come as a young monk to be at Tassahara and be at, at City Center, just to kind of to live the life and be there. Yeah. And uh, as far as we knew, as far as I knew, he was just like an ordinary, simple monk. Yeah. And uh, so we became friends. And when I was going to go to Japan, he taught me some Japanese. And and he then um, uh, arranged for uh, Jim Phelan and I, Jim was going to go too, to... Um, uh, made our 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 soto zen, got our soto zen robes made in oh. Japan. So when we got there, they were already made. And then, um, and then he was um, going to sponsor me to go to uh, Zuioji. Oh, uh. And, uh, but that, but then it turned out that my ordination in America was not official in Japan, so I couldn't be accepted at Zuioji because of that. Yeah. So, uh, so Gengo's teacher said, "Well, he tried to find someone to ordain me, but then Gengo's teacher in Japan said, you ordain him.' So we went up to northern Japan to his teacher's temple, I guess, and um, and they did a little ordination ceremony for me. So I, I got an official Japanese ordination. Now, now, uh, who? Uh, I want to be clear on who ordained you. G- Gengo. Gen- uh, Gengo he, went there and did it. it. Wow. Yeah. And he's from northern Japan. Where? No, he's from Tokyo. But but that his temple was his teacher his teacher's temple was in northern Japan. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, it, yeah. I see. Yeah. So as we went up I there see. and, and I did, did, yeah. did the ceremony there. Uh, I, I would and just like to we, clarify who you're talking about. Gengo yeah. uh, Akiba went on to become the bishop of Soto Zen in America and the priest at, at um at uh, uh, Zen Shuji in Los Angeles and married uh-huh. Yoshi of uh, Yoshi's, um, uh, you know, uh, nightclub in Oakland. Uh-huh. And uh, they created a Zendo there. And now he's got this whole big monastery. Are they still building that thing? They've been trying for years. As far as, far, as, far as I know, it's still being built. Yeah, in Lake County. All right. I just wanted to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good, yeah. There. yeah, so so um so then I, I went to uh in 
But then I had to get a new visa. So the, the practice period at Zuyoji was going to start, I think, in March, March or April, I think. And um, but I, I needed to get a new visa to stay in Japan. And I knew that before I went to Japan. So when I got a ticket from San Francisco, it turned out it was something like twenty five dollars more uh, uh, than going to just a Japan round trip is I can get a round trip ticket to Bangkok with free stopovers both directions. Oh yeah. So I knew I had to so I knew I had to go to leave, leave Japan to get the visa, so I had to stick it to Bangkok just coincidentally because of the price. Yeah. And um and then um I thought, well and then I'd been studying uh Abhidharma with Red uh before going there. With, uh, pardon and, uh, me, with, with, knew, well, with, you know, with Reb, did Reb you? Reb Anderson. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. He was teaching for years. He taught classes in Abhidharma. And yeah. so, uh, I, I went, um, I thought, well, you know, in, in Theravada countries, they, they still have the, the Abhidharma is still living for them. They actually live by it and practice it. And, and, um, and so I said, well, you know, I, I tried to go there and learn something. Also, there were people who were, um, uh, I was a priest, and people were coming to me asking me questions about meditation that I couldn't answer. And I said, you know, I need to learn the map of meditation. I need to understand meditation better. So first I thought I'd just go around and visit all kinds of meditation teachers in Thailand and ask questions. And then I thought, no, no, let's go to one and and just do whatever practice they tell me to do. Mm-hmm. And so I had an I had an address of a little dog patch, chaotic little meditation monastery on the edges of Bangkok. And that's what I did. I went there and said, here I am. Teach me to meditate. And uh, um, and, I'm, I was, and I started doing it every day. And and it was um, every day I'd go see the abbot for more instruction. And he was teaching Vipassana, Mahasi, so I thought Mahasi, uh, Mahasi practice. Mm-hmm. And, then, um, and then I was waiting for my visa for Japan to come back. And after 10 weeks, I figured the visa wasn't coming. And so my first uh, uh, Vipassana retreat was like it was a 10 week session. Uh, you know, just practicing sitting, walking, sitting, walking, right. sitting all day long. And, and, um, and, and my ability to get concentrated is not that good. But sitting for that long, I got concentrated in the way I've never had before Zen practice. And yeah, it wasn't like I was enamored with getting concentrated, but in that deep concentration, I touched something that uh, it felt like a small little thing deep inside of me. That uh, it be- somehow or other, it became essential to me that I touch that again. Nothing else mattered, and it became a little bit of a dark night of the soul because I knew that I knew that's what I had to do. Yeah, but I had it all set up. I had all set up to go back to Japan and do the uh, do the practice period. So I did. And um, wait a minute, the practice Uh, practice period period where? At Zuyoji. Oh, horrors! Really? How was that? It it, it was uh, uh, underwhelming for me (laughs) because because they meditated so little. That's right. They actually meditated. There was less zazen than Tassahara. Uh huh. There was a lot of lot of ritual, yeah. and a lot of extra work. You know, silly things like we would all the monks went out to mow the lawn with scissors. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and there was a lot of drinking of alcohol, and and uh, so, but it, you know, it was a sincere, it was considered a sincere place of practice. It was small. Yes. Yes. It was you know in some ways it was nice to be there. It turned out to be nicer in the end than I realized, but um, uh, it's, I had this uh, a very important moment halfway through the session where I realized that, um, and it was so familiar to Tassahara, it, the forms and the chants were just like Tassahara. It's like, I know all this. And, um, and so then, uh, but halfway through, I realized this is not for me. And then was this great parental figure, father figure for me, like authoritative, true, absolute. And I'm this little kid and I can't stand up. I, I have to kind of, you know, go along with the father and do whatever it says. I have no, I can't stand up for myself. And so 
I stood up for myself. I said, no, this is right. I know I have to leave. And, mm-hmm. uh, and that was a very important uh, kind of maturing moment for me to, to take that stand and know I needed to do this and, and not be cowered by the, my projected enormity of, you know, this Zen Buddhist institution. Yeah. And, um, and as I made it, it was really clear, I made the decision to leave. But once I made the decision to leave, uh, I realized that if I left in the middle of the practice period, it might ruin Gengo Akiba's reputation in Japan. Well, that's a, a good, uh, that, that's uh, very thoughtful of you. I think that's a good point. And then I stayed. But then, then I stayed for that reason. And that was easy to stay. It was like, okay, I'd made my decision. I'd grown yeah. up. And, and now I didn't have to leave as much. And I, so I stayed and finished. And when I finished uh, and I left, only then did I realize how much I'd been changed by it. Because yeah. Zen, practice ha- Zen practice happens in the body. And uh, my body had changed yeah. by being there and following the forms. And, I, and then I came to yeah. appreciate it. Oh, I'm glad I stayed. It did make a difference. For yeah. Me. Yeah. That's the sort of, um, you know, uh, Nonin Chamwani was there for years. And uh, mm-hmm. he just, oh, uh, he, he just you know, tangled with them all, with Narazaki. Narazaki, which one was the habit? Uh, Echo, Roshi. Narazaki, Echo. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, you know, he got, a, a, he realized, you know, how much he'd gotten out of it, that it, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, um, anyway, yeah, I, I can appreciate yeah. that. And, uh, you know, that's what Richard Baker did at AHG. But uh, mm-hmm. Suzuki just begged him to stay. Come on, just finish one practice yeah. period. But he absolutely <laughs> refused. And Suzuki went there to visit him. And uh, uh, so he said, nope, I'm going out with you. So uh, if, if Baker, had, uh, you know, he should have been willing to stick it out. But, you know, he he, he was um, he, he didn't have any thoughts like you did about uh, Zen is the father or whatever, you know. Uh, he was already uh, pretty self, uh, self-determination yeah, yeah. guy. And uh, so he left. It was a big embarrassment to Suzuki, but he survived it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, so, the, so then, so then um, I stayed, and, and then I had run out of my time in Japan, run out of money, and so then I went um, – came back to Zen Center. And then mm. another time where I was really grateful for Zen Center, I, I, I wanted to, then by that time, because I wanted to touch that place inside again, I, the only thing I knew how to do that was to do these long Vipassana retreats in Asia. Yeah. And, um, and it wasn't like I was enamored with Vipassana. I just was had to touch that place again. And um, so, I, so all I needed to do was go back to Southeast Asia and do that. And so I asked Zen Center, and I think Leslie James was the president. Uh, I asked them if I can get free room and board for uh, some time, and I'd go work at Greens and earn the money to go back to Asia. And uh, and they agreed. And mm. I felt so so well taken care of for Zen Center that they would yeah. offer me that. I mean, that was a huge huge gift for me. So after three months, I had two thousand dollars and. And uh, so in January, I got on a plane and went to Bangkok. I applied for a visa to go to Burma. I didn't know that Burma was closed then to everyone. And so I kind of went around and practiced in different monasteries in Japan. And um, Oh, places. really? Really? Well, come no, on. And not Japan. In, in different monasteries. I'm sorry. I, my, 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 I practiced in different monasteries in uh, um, in Thailand. All right, and, which, uh, which and, ones? Did you go down south, you know, the... Yeah, I went to Swan Mok. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I did it. I practiced quite a bit there. A was the there teacher, the, teach, was the, the teacher was still alive, the founding teacher? Or, or, uh-huh. Yeah, Ajahn Buddhadasa. Ajahn Buddhadasa was still there. Uh, he had, and, uh, he had, would, had tell me, him. tell, tell then, me about him. Oh, so he was a radical reformer kind of monk who uh, went off on his own, did a lot of studies, studied Zen, and uh, and uh, kind of demythologized Theravadan Buddhism, and uh, and made it much more this world centric. Yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, for him, life and death was not 
you know, we birth over lifetimes, but rather we birth in this lifetime. Mm-hmm. And he talked a lot about, he gave it, talked a lot about emptiness, mm-hmm. uh, which was kind of unusual. And, and, uh, you know, how Nibbana was available here and now. So he was a very, very significant teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And so I practiced there. And then finally, I was able to go uh, to Burma. And I went there in September of 1985. And I sat in eight months session <laughs> in, a room, most, in a room mostly by myself. And that was uh, some of the happiest times of my life. Mm. And so much joy and well-being and and uh, I was practicing with Upandita, who was a very tough kind of, uh, he was more like a military general, kind of tough and stern and angry meditation teacher. And, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I went there with, a, I think I had, a, I had an attitude that protected me from him. And that was, I was there to practice uh, Shikantaza uh, more thoroughly. So I, I followed his instructions pretty carefully. I was a good student that way. But in my heart, it, I was doing those instructions so I could sit Shikantaza better. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and uh, I was constantly kind of bringing Zen and Vipassana together, finding out how can I harmonize this for myself and make this work for me. And, and that was a good exercise. Mm-hmm. And, um, but there I, I went to, I kind of, uh, um, you know, in, in a certain kind of way, completed the course of vipassana practice, and um, at some point, it made sense to um, to leave, and then I came back, and I wasn't planning to stay at Zen Center, but one of my best friends had become the farm manager at Zen Center, at Green Gulch, and um, who, and who, so, who, Harold, Harold Galliser. Oh yeah, right. And uh, and so he wanted me to come to Green Gulch. I also had a girlfriend from Zen Center who had come with me, kind of come with me to Asia, named Rosie Mehauder from Brazil. And she um, uh, she 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 uh, was really damaged by practicing the, the vipassana with Upandita in Burma. Really, so she needed to kind of rec- she needed psychological help. And uh, so she wanted to be close to Reb. She was felt close to him, who was to Green Gulch then. So my friend said, well, why don't you, she come to Green Gulch, why don't you come as a spouse? And uh, I'm going to give you my car, my Volkswagen Bug, and you can go make money by going to work at Green's. Mm. So uh, that's what I did with the plan in the fall to go to IMS, Inside Meditation Society in Massachusetts, to continue the Vipassana practice. But uh, as the summer went along, I had this deep weariness inside. I was too weary to go in another long retreat like that. And so I told people at Zen Center, at, at Green Gulch, that I wasn't going. And they immediately asked me to be Eno. Uh-huh. So that was fun to be All right, now, to be now wait. Eno. I want to clarify something. Yeah. You're at Green Gulch now, right? Yes. And uh, are you working with Harold? Uh, no, I, I no, I was working at Greens. I was I was a spouse category there, so I was not, you know, I was just there because I was kind of. You were the Rosie. spouse, okay? Okay. I was the spouse. I got. I uh, oh, that's funny. Uh, and um, and what year? And when, when, what year is this? That was the summer of '85. Oh, I was there. Yeah. And then, uh, and I so would it, be. It I was like, the director then. <laughs> No, I no. When I when I got there, Norman was the director. Did he did he take over from you? Who was the director? Norman. Eighty six. Oh wait a minute, eighty six. No, I got there in eighty six. It was summer of eighty six. Yeah. Yeah, I was just like Norman an was, interim director because uh, yeah. things had sort of fallen apart, and. Um, uh, uh, Nor- Norman was, uh, uh, you know, a really good director. Yes. And, uh, and so, but things are still, had still fallen apart when I came there. And so when I was made Eno, 
uh, one of the first things that Blanche, who was there, asked me to do, or Norman, I don't know who asked me, was that they wanted to do the first practice period outside of Tassahara. So they told me to organize it. And that was the blast. I made up the schedule. I just kind of, it was really fun to kind of, you know, conjure a practice period out of nothing. And because everything was falling, had fallen apart there, um, you know, there wasn't really enough people to do things and the work leader wasn't really that on top of things. And um, so I felt like I kind of had the freedom to just play and kind of do things and create things and mm-hmm. make things happen. And, and, um, so I loved it there. It's busy, you know, and it was nice. And Mel came out, you know, that was around the time where Red had his uh, gun incident and then Mel started being the, the abbot. And so it was nice. I really, I, I, Red was one of my important teachers. So it was really great that he started coming out. The gr- yeah. That, uh, and, the gun thing was, uh, 87, right? Yeah. Was it eighty seven? Yeah, yeah. What, what to, Look, I'm the one. I, I'm the one that Reb called from jail, and I was the ten so in the building and answered the kitchen phone. Eighty seven. Yeah. So anyway, anyways, so so Mel at some point showed up because yeah. of that. Yeah. And um, so so, I, but then during that year where that was Eno, that's when Ron Browning came to see me. Oh yeah, and he was, uh, and uh, and we took a walk down to the beach, and um, and I was talking about my experience in Burma and what happened to me, and in the course of that conversation, I understood that, that I had confused mindfulness with concentration. Say and it so again. Was, you I had confused mindfulness, uh, concentration for mindfulness. Uh huh. And uh, I got to, I couldn't really separate those two out in my mind. And so what would happen in doing the Pasna practice, I'd been pushing concentration too much. And as soon as I understood that, my weariness disappeared. Remember, I didn't go to IMS because of the weariness. Right. Mm. And the moment I understood that, that, that I'd made that mistake, the weariness went away and I was ready to go to IMS for three months. Wow. Now, did Ron help you understand that? I don't know if he helped me. It just kind of came out in the conversation. Maybe yeah. I understood it myself. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember the details. But, well, that's really that good like, to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so then I went to IMS, and he told me to go to the up to the attic, and there's a in this attic were the a box with his robes from Meheji. He told me I could have them. So I came home from IMS with those robes, and I still have some of them. I've tried to give them away to other people, but I think I still have some of them here. That's very interesting because he burned when he came. Okay, sir. Yeah, at at Tassahara. Uh, ah. I was there, uh, and um, uh, yeah. Uh, so, but he didn't. Burn, he just burned his okay, sir. Incidentally. He he said he did that uh, as an act of purification. Um, I see. Uh-huh. Uh, anyway, you I can couldn't... read about it uh, in his interview on Cuke dot com. Uh, all right, so you got his robes from from that school. That's great. Yeah, so that was kind of fun. And so then um, I did the three months at IMS, and that was very impactful for me. And um, but then I, I uh, then Reb asked me to go be. Issue so at Tassahara. So it was kind of nice after uh, doing that three months. Uh, it was a nice integration, nice way to continue, was to then do another three months as a practice period at Tassahara. And, uh, but then I was starting to feel that, you know, I done, now by this time I'd done 10 years of monastic practice. And I, I felt like I had completed something. And I felt that uh, that was, you know, I said, what am I going to do? It doesn't make sense to keep living at Zen Center forever. Uh, and I, don't, I want to stay close to Buddhism. I don't. I have nothing else I want to do. So what am I going to do? And I said, well, maybe if I go and get a master's in Buddhist studies, religious studies, I could teach classes in Buddhism at a junior college and make enough money to you know, continue somehow and without being at a, a Zen Center. Mm-hmm. So, so I applied to... Um, Universe. Oh, someone, Judy 
Judy Gilbert had given me this book on the Middle Way by uh, the Guardian of Middle Way translation and commentary by um, David Kalupahana. Mm -hmm. And I loved this book on Nagarjuna. And David Kalupahana was was a uh, professor at the University of Hawaii in Manoa, in Hawaii. And so um, I applied to go get a a master's there. And uh, because I didn't have anything else to do, that I had this plan, I would somehow, that would get a career, somehow teaching a little bit. And, um, and I loved, I loved getting the masters. It was like a kid in the candy store because I hadn't really studied much about Buddhism in my 10 years of practice. So that was really fun. And, um, and then, uh, I practiced with, uh, Aiken Roshi. Uh-huh. His, 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 his Zendo, his house was just like, one or two blocks from the university. So I did a lot of, you know, a lot of co-on practice with him and, and I just loved him. And, uh, and, uh, I just loved uh, being able to sit and have Dokustan with him, even if it also only lasted a minute. And, um, uh, and then I, uh, I finished my master's and uh, I said, well, what do I do next? I didn't have any career or ambition beyond, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. I just know I wasn't, didn't make sense to continue with Zen press, you know, with Zen center. But, um, Hey, but, could uh, I ask you a question? Yeah. What are you doing? Oh, because it's, it's way over time for me. I have to drive home, talk to my wife to have dinner. Yeah. So I just closed, I'm so, I should have told you, excuse me, because I made a lot of noise. No, well, that's all right. And it'll be, it'll, it'll, we keep talking. It'll be, it'll if you have to do it, it's it'll, all right. Yeah, it'll be quieter in a minute. Let me get in the car. Uh, and, uh, and then keep keep going. In there. You, you don't have to stop so, talking. So, uh, okay, just one second. Okay, so, um, so I didn't have anything, you know, I didn't what am I going to do? I'm, I don't want to go back. It doesn't make sense to go back to Zen Center right now. And I don't have any other ambitions for life. I'm a Zen priest. You know, I, I want to just practice in Buddhism as my thing, but I didn't know what to do. And I, I had a great time doing a master's in Buddhist studies. That was like so much fun. So um, I applied and I wanted to be back in the Bay Area because I wanted to be near um, my my Buddhist teachers. And um my Zen teachers, and by that time I knew Jack Cornfield a bit, and I wanted to sort of have some contact with him. Yeah. Now, who and, were your um, Zen teachers? Uh, well, it was, it was Richard Baker and Mel Weitzman. And then, in retrospect, uh, Reb was very important for me. I didn't realize how much he, he was a teacher for me um, until after the fact. But uh, when I was living in in San Francisco as at City Center. Uh, I would have a practice discussion with him once a week. And uh, I kind of a little bit took it for granted. Uh, I didn't, you know, he was available. He made himself available for me. And and so I met, met with him. And and uh, I think those meetings were turned out to be, I didn't really think of him as my teacher. But in fact, uh, I think he had a very big impact on me. Mm. I'm very grateful for uh, his guidance and his support and, his transmission kind of, of who, you know, that somehow he provided me those practice discussions. Mm. And uh, so those three, those are the three main people. Mm-hmm. And mm. then, uh, so then I applied to go to get a PhD at, um, at the GTU, the graduate, graduate theological union in Berkeley. Yeah. And, uh, and at uh, Stanford university, and I really didn't get ex- expect to get accepted to either one, but to my surprise, I was. And and then Stanford offered a, a, a scholarship uh, for living expenses, Ooh. and I didn't have any money. So I said, "Wow, well, I'll go to Stanford now for sure." Yeah. And what I didn't understand about academic university research universities like Stanford compared to a master's is that it's not so much fun. Uh, it's a really in, intense, detailed analysis, critiquing uh, philo- philology and philosophy, and and um, 
and uh, tearing things down and showing how every, everybody's wrong and and um, <laughs> and it, it you know it wasn't really that much fun, but the two 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 things kept me there. One was um, I thought I should you should finish what you start. Mm-hmm. And I, I was going to study with Carl Bielfeld. Yeah, right. And uh, there, and so um, you finish what you start, and then um, and I was I was there to study Zen. I was going to do a, a dissertation on Dogen, but uh, 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 anyway, so you finish what you start, and the other I was studied agriculture in Davis. Yeah, I was a born again organic organicist, and. And when I started studying, taking classes there in the science of farming, I discovered that some of my zealot, zealousness around what is the true organic farming and how terrible commercial fertilizers are, that the science of it did not support these ideas. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, I was really, really had a religious kind of you know, fanaticism around these organic farming ideas. Now that I'm involved with religion, people in religion are worse at being fanatics. <laughs> and so, and so I kind of felt the kind of study we did at Stanford, which was a lot of critical thinking and a lot of looking, looking at our, looking at, at beliefs and assumptions and where they come from and yeah. learning to think carefully and explain that this is really good for me. It will protect me from being too much of a fundamentalist around Buddhism. Right, good. So th- so those are the two things that kept me there. Yeah. And uh, and then indirectly, uh, I had a lot of freedom there. And so I just went to school two quarters of a year so that I could uh, do retreats and I could do... But that, oh, by that time, I was in uh, Jack Cornfield's teacher training Mm. So they, to become a Vipassana teacher. And Nell kind of wanted me to come over to see him every week so I can get ready for Dharma transmission. Mm. And so I, I, I did all these other things besides being a graduate student. Mm. And Stanford gave me lots of uh, room to do that, which is a little bit unusual for someone in a doctoral program. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. That's good. Impressive. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, huh. so uh, you know, I, so uh, there was a period of time where I was getting a PhD in Buddhist studies, studying for Dharma transmission with Mel, and studying the Pasna teacher tra- training with Jack Cornfield. So, I mean, that's it's a bit crazy. Mm, it sounds great. But that's how my mind, that's that's how that's how it turned out. Yeah. And then um, and, and then when it all finished, it was kind of the Vipassana world that. Has soaked me up, mm-hmm. and, you know. And Zen, Zen Center had so many teachers, and there wasn't really a need for another teacher there in some ways. So, yeah. And I never expected them. I never expected them to ask me. So, but the Vipassana world had a big need for teachers, and they just kind of, um, I that, uh, and I enjoyed it a lot, and that became my life mm. for the most part. Hmm. Uh, you're, you're, uh, certainly your Vipassana is informed by Zen, <laughs> I would say. Yes, yes. When, when people from Zen Center come to our the retreat center we have in Santa Cruz, as soon as they they go there, they oh, they say, oh, this is where the Zen comes in. Gil Zen comes out here. <laughs> people, uh, Vipassana students don't know it because they don't know anything about Zen Center. But Zen Center says, oh, okay, <laughs> there it is. That's great. That's great. So I think we came. I think we came to a nice conclusion, isn't it? I'm, I'm home now, and I should. Uh, I should go to my wife. Yeah, yeah, Tamara. Yes. Now Tamara was at Green Gulch when you were there when you first came. That's where. That's where I met her. Yeah. She, she was. She was driving with the red tractor. The, yeah. Uh, when I first saw her. Yeah, and she and Sophie Wheelwright were very close. I remember that. They're still friends. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, that this has been great. Um, if I have any other questions, I'll send you uh, an email. Uh, there great. Both- it was so lovely, lo- lovely to talk to you again. I, I really enjoyed it, and I, it sounds like you're doing well. And 
and I'm happy to to know that you're in a in a place that you that works so well for you in Bali. Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, uh, I'm fanatically working, uh, and can appreciate your fanatically studying and doing all that. Although the stuff you did, I I would be incapable of doing. Uh, uh, my energy was applied in a different way, but um, uh. Yeah, I'm, and I I love doing this. I loved hearing what you had to say, and um, it's really uh, thanks for taking us uh, on that um, excursion there. Yeah, and what and what you're doing with uh, the cuke dot com dot com dot org is um, really com. important. Really, com really great. Yeah, thank you for doing it. Thank you, thank you. And Shunyu Suzuki dot com is uh, constantly being. Uh, Worked on and upgraded. Mm-hmm. Um, and did I send you uh, the poem that was in Suzuki in the English translation of the poem that was in Suzuki Roshi's diary? Uh, well, please do. I, I can't I'll send it to you. I can't remember what I have or don't have. I'll send it. Very touching poem. Uh, it's someone else's poem, but it looks like he he must have wrote it uh, into his in the back of his 1959 diary. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I will uh, send it to you. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Thanks a Great. lot. Wonderful to talk to you. Okay. Yeah, wonderful to talk to you. Take care, David. Bye bye. Bye bye. So thank you very much, Gil Gil Fransdale. Uh Really interesting. Very good. Uh, uh, very impressive. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Uh, keep up the good work poem he was mentioning that uh, that was in Junior Suzuki's diary. I'd call it a date book. Um, uh, he, he wrote it down uh, in there. It's, it's near the back. Uh, it's Tasks of Life Complete All Alone. Uh, I go happily to the forested mountain. And that is attributed to Shigeko Yoshikawa. Ah, Shigeko. I think of Ko as being a feminine, a woman's name. But I don't know. Any, incidentally, that diary is on cuke.com, uh, or date book, um, and, uh, of course, you might not know where to find it. I think if you just go to uh, uh, Shunyu Suzuki on it, or write, write Suzuki Diary in, in the site search box. Uh, and uh, uh, in, incidentally, we're right in the process now of putting up a PDF that is has a much smaller file. It's it's too big a file right now. I looked at it yesterday with twenty nine megabytes. It's slow loading, so I I, I I was reducing it to nine megabytes, but uh, uh, but my anyway it got stuck. So I asked Peter to do it, Peter Ford, and uh, his electricity just went out. <laughs> so it it'll be up soon uh, with the Japanese. Anyway, it's um, I'm I'm going to read it again, because you know this is a poem that Junior Suzuki wrote down in the back of the date book, uh, which uh, he, he just used like when he was first in America for a while, uh, and, and which is one year, and um, uh, it's the only thing like that in it, I think, but. Uh, it's somebody else's poem, and it was expressing, I think, how he felt leaving Japan, coming to America, uh, you know, starting starting off something completely new. Tasks of life complete, all alone. Ah, I go happily to the forested mountain. This has been a Cuke Audio podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives. Coming to you from Sleepy Senor with Dog Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and dear lovely Katrinka. 
and we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening.